Okay, let's pray for our time in God's Word, Romans chapter 8, starting at verse 31. God, thank you for today uh, to gather together with brothers and sisters and wait upon you to hear from heaven. And as much as these wonderful servants have prayed and prepared, all those who serve behind the scenes, we acknowledge you as Lord of your church and you can edit these services at your will. We really do want to hear what's on your heart. Here's where we are today as we've been working our way through your word. But we really long for a fresh word from your word, by your spirit. So speak to us. Let it be very tangible, very obvious that you're speaking directly to us as individuals. And then also give us collectively a sense that you're speaking and leading us as a congregation. You're speaking over us how you see us, speaking into us who we are in you, what's available to us in you, and help your voice to crowd out all others, Lord. And we can hear that still, small voice speak from heaven, how much you love us and how you're with us and you're never going to leave us and you're never going to forsake us. And out of the overflow, let our lives respond to you, Lord, by saying thank you forever in all that we do. We love you, Lord, and it's in your name we pray. Amen. So Romans chapter 8, let's read verses 31 through 39. Verse 31. What then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, Who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? Who shall bring a charge against God's elect? It's God who justifies. Who is he who condemns? It's Christ who died and furthermore is also risen, who is even at the right hand of God, who also makes intercession for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? As it is written, for your sake, we are killed all day long. We're accounted as sheep for the slaughter. Yet, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am persuaded or convinced that neither death nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. What then shall we say to these things, huh? I mean, wow. This is how Paul begins this crescendo of all that he's led us through since the beginning of the book of Romans. What shall we say to these things? Since the beginning of the book of Romans, which for us was 31 studies ago. Can you believe that? We began the book of Romans in the beginning of January. And if you think in your mind's eye all the way back to the book of Romans at the beginning, we go all the way back to when Paul said, I am a bond servant of Christ. I serve Jesus as a slave on purpose. And Paul, being led of the Lord, wrote what we're reading, and he wrote this to us to give us a clear and compelling, layered and logical argument for God's righteousness at Christ's expense, for God's righteousness given to us as a gift, for God's righteousness received by us through faith, God's righteousness given as a gift, a gift, a gift, not a contract, a gift. Not earned, not deserved, not merited, not worked for, not added to. God's righteousness given to us as a gift. And that gift was paid for by the blood of his one and only son. His son, Jesus, who laid down his life to free us from our sin by willingly paying our penalty in full so that we could be justified. 
so that it could be just as if we had never, ever sinned in the eyes of God, so that we could be justified freely by his grace, his unmerited favor, the redemption that's found in Christ Jesus. This is the good news. But is that where Paul began in the beginning of the book of Romans? Well, kind of. At the beginning of the book of Romans, he said something to set the stage. He said, I am not ashamed of the gospel because it's the power of God that brings salvation to everyone who believes, first to the Jew and then to the Gentile. For in the gospel, the righteousness of God is revealed, a righteousness that is by faith from first to last. Just as it is written, the righteousness will live by faith. And in two verses, he sets the stage for the good news. But in order for us to understand the good news, we also have to understand the bad news. So he invests several chapters helping us to understand the bad news and why the good news is so good. He says things like, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. He shows systematically the impossibility of obtaining righteousness any other way than a gift by grace through faith. Systematically, clearly, layered, logical, all have sinned and fall short of God's standard, which is perfection. All have sinned and fall short of God's standard, which is perfection, including Jews, Gentiles, deists, moralists, including the outwardly immoral, including the really religious. Remember, all the way back months ago, all have sinned and fall short. And the wages of sin is death. And as we were working our way through those chapters, we saw how Paul would dangle us over the cliff of eternity for a little while so that we could appreciate this fully, that there is absolutely no way to earn or merit or contribute to or deserve or otherwise work for our salvation or entrance into heaven. Because all of us have sinned, every man, every woman, all of time, all of us have sinned and fall short of God's standard, and the wages of sin is death. And just about the time where we feel we're going to fall off the cliff into eternity, helpless and hopeless, (laughs) at just about the, the time where we're understanding the fullness of the bad news, he introduces the good news. He says, the wages of sin is death, but... The gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus, our Lord. He tells us that God saw us in our helpless and hopeless state, and he loved us in our helpless and hopeless state, and he sent us Jesus in our helpless and hopeless state. God loved us so much that he demonstrated his love for us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. We read this. God demonstrates his love for us in that while we were at our worst, Jesus still died for us. And Jesus died for us not only to pay our penalty, but Jesus also died for us so that he could give us his righteousness. And this is how God sees us now, clean, forgiven, free, and totally and completely righteous if, if we are in Christ. And knowing that many of us are really religious and we're trying to dot I's and cross T's apart from a real relationship in Christ, he invested another several chapters encouraging us to trust in Christ and Christ alone. Don't wander back to the familiar of ritual and routine. Don't wander back to the familiar of religion. Don't get caught on that pendulum between legalism and license. All of these things can be done apart from trusting in and having a real relationship with Jesus. And Jesus never wanted any of this nonsense. He's always and only wanted our heart. He's always and only wanted us. He has never wanted from us smells and bells. He has never wanted from us ritual and routine. He's never wanted from us legalism and license. They're all traps. They're all the trappings of religion. And religion apart from relationship will only end in condemnation. Asleep in the light, apart from a real relationship with him, 
He wants us. He wants our heart honest with him. Religion apart from relationship will only end in condemnation. Religion apart from relationship will only end in the exclamation, oh, what a wretched man I am. But thankfully, there's someone who was sent to save me from this wretched body of death. What's his name? Jesus. And there is, therefore, now, no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. No condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. And that goes for now, and now, and now, and now, and even now, and now too, and now, and also now. Here's where the good news gets even gooder. Not only did he love us enough to lay down his life for us, not only did he pay the penalty of our sin in full, not only did he give us his full and complete righteousness, not only did he do all of this when we were at our worst, but he also gives us his Holy Spirit, his Holy Spirit. The Bible says that he gives us his Holy Spirit as a down payment to let us know that he's serious. He gives us his Holy Spirit as earnest money to let us know that he's serious about completing all of this. His Holy Spirit, who is God, given to us to dwell within us, to lead us and to help us and to teach us and to empower us and to direct us and to edify us and to exhort us and to comfort us and to seal us and to pray for us and to protect us and to transform us and to walk with us. He wants to be with us. Jesus gives us his Holy Spirit to help us in our weaknesses. Jesus gives us his Holy Spirit to help us in the meantime. Jesus gives us his Holy Spirit to help us when life throws at us way more than our heart could handle on its own. Do you remember last week when we were talking about that verse that is so often quoted out of context that the Lord won't give you more than you can handle? They summarize a verse that doesn't even mean that. That verse in its context is saying that we're all tempted in ways that are common to everyone, and you've never been forced to sin that God will always provide a way out of sin. And we, through just experience, have come to the conclusion, apart from that verse quoted out of context, that God regularly allows things in our life that are way more than our heart can handle. It's what he does. And yet he's still good. If any of you have read Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe, remember the question about Aslan, who represents Jesus? Someone asked the question, is he safe? What was the answer? Oh, no. <laughs> He's not safe. But he is good. And we're trying to figure out how those two exist. So often the goodness of God is questioned when he sovereignly allows difficulty in our life. Even when he sovereignly allows the enemy to bring difficulty in our life. And yet he is still good because we know we've been learning that he can work all things together for the good of those who are called according to his purposes and love him with their hearts. Here's what we're learning. He is for us. He is with us. He is in our corner. He is on our side. He will never leave us. He will never forsake us. He has adopted us. He is preparing a place for us a place for us to be with him forever as full members of his family. What then shall we say to these things? You know, when I read it like that, the thing that just bubbles up out of our hearts, it's thank you, Jesus. That's thanks, wow, that's what I'll say to these things. That's, this is amazing. But I don't think he's actually asking the question that way. I don't think that's exactly how he's asking this question. I think the way he's asking this question is like, in the face of all this, is there anything more to say? Like in this layered, logical, airtight argument that brings you to the immutable conclusion that God is for you, is there anything else that anyone could say to convince us otherwise? What are we going to say to all of this? We have, we've had eight chapters of this layered, logical, airtight argument that comes to the 
immutable conclusion that God is for you. He's for you. Look at all that he's done for you. Look at all that he's given to you. He explained to you the bad news. He helped you understand the good news. What are we going to... Nope, this is what we're going to say. If God is for us, who could be against us? Isn't that what Paul says as almost an exclamation after that? Listen to verse 31 through 39 again. What then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who could be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? Who shall bring a charge against God's elect? It's God who justifies. Who is he who condemns? Christ who died and furthermore is also risen, who is even at the right hand of God, who also makes intercession for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? As it is written, for your sake we're killed all day long. We are accounted as sheep for the slaughter. Yet, yet, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. This certainly is the crescendo of the, of the, of the book of Romans here. And think this through. We're only halfway through the book. But all that he said so far and praying about giving this word today, I wanted to just read this word a few times so that you can hear the word of the Lord and so that faith could come by hearing, so that you could hear what he has to say and that something more than just intellectual understanding could happen, but that his word could be written on your heart by faith with the same finger that penned on those tablets of stone. That he could write with fire on your heart that these things are true. And he could help us to really stomp our foot in faith and walk them out, to work out our salvation as good as it is. So that the watching world could see that this really is what God has done. So listen, just listen to the word of the Lord. What shall we say about such wonderful things as these? If God is for us, who could ever be against us? Since he did not spare even his own son, but gave him up for us all, won't he also give us everything else? Who dares accuse us whom God has chosen for his own? No one. For God himself has given us right standing with himself. Who who then is going to condemn us? No one. For Christ Jesus died for us and was raised to life for us, and he's sitting in the place of honor at God's right hand, pleading for us. Can anything ever separate us from Christ's love? Does it mean that he no longer loves us if we have trouble or calamity or are persecuted or hungry or destitute or in danger or threatened with death? As the scriptures say, for your sake, We're killed every day. We're being slaughtered like sheep. But no, despite all these things, overwhelming victory is ours through Christ who loved us. And I am convinced that nothing can ever separate us from God's love. Neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither our fears for today nor our worries about tomorrow. Not even the powers of hell can separate us from God's love. No power in the sky above or in the earth below. Indeed, nothing in all of creation will ever be able to separate us from the love of God that is revealed in Christ Jesus our Lord. That was one translation. Listen to another. One more. Listen. In the face of all of this, what is there left to say? If God is for us, Who can be against us? 
He that did not hesitate to spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, can we not trust such a God to give us with him everything else that we can need? Who would dare accuse us whom God has chosen? The judge himself has declared us free from sin. Who's in a position to condemn? Only Christ, and Christ died for us. Christ rose for us. Christ reigns in power for us. Christ prays for us. Can anything separate us from the love of Christ? Can trouble, pain, persecution? Can lack of clothes, lack of food, danger to life and limb, threat of force? Indeed, some of us know the truth of the ancient text. For your sake, we are killed all day long. We are accounted as sheep for the slaughter. No, in all these things, we win. In all these things, we win. In all these things, we win. An overwhelming victory through him who has proved his love for us. I have become absolutely convinced that neither death nor life, neither messenger of heaven nor monarch of the earth, neither what happens today nor what may happen tomorrow, neither a power from on high nor a power from below, nor anything else in God's whole world has the power to separate us from the love of God in Jesus Christ, our Lord. Whoa. These are the exclamation points of all that God has said through the Apostle Paul from Romans chapter 1 to Romans chapter 8. And again, as awesome as this is, think this through. We're only halfway through the book of Romans. Wow. Praise the Lord. Now let's pause for a moment. And consider what we've read through slowly, carefully. We'll go through it just a, maybe a verse at a time. Let's go back to the beginning of the section that we're studying today. Let's go back to verse 31. Just verse 31. Here's what verse 31 says. What then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? So we know, we now know, we know God is for us. We know this by now, this far into Romans. God is for us. And if God is for us, no one can be against us. Just think through the math of this. Even if our greatest enemy intends the greatest evil against us, and even if God allows this, we also know that all things work together for good to those who love God and are called according to his purpose. Even if our greatest enemy intends the greatest evil, and even if God allows it, what the enemy intended for evil, God allowed for good. Where did that come from? Do you remember Joseph and his brothers? His brothers got jealous, wanted to take him out, wearing the fancy clothes. God likes, or dad likes you the best. Throws you into a pit, leaves you for dead, sold as a slave. The whole roller coaster of his life, he ends up being second to Pharaoh. They don't recognize him. There's a point where they, he finally reveals himself to them, and he's bawling over this reconciled relationship. They're bawling over conviction of what they've done to Joseph. And he says to them, listen, what you intended for evil, God allowed for good, for good. Look at, what's, look at what's happened. This is part of how we are more than victorious through him who loved us. Even if, even if our greatest enemy intends the greatest evil against us, and even if God allows it, he can still work it for our good to those who love God and to those who are called according to his purpose. And do you remember what his purpose is? His purpose for us is that we would be conformed to the image of his son. His purpose for us is that we would be in that process of being conformed to the image of his son. And do we think that that process is without pain? No, that process includes pain. But it's in the meantime, in the in-between time, in the vapor, 
preparing us for heaven. But when the pain clouds our vision and tempts us to question his love for us or even his goodness, the cross of Christ remains. You ever been in a situation where you're looking at your present circumstances and you're questioning, how can God be good and allow this to be in my life? Apart from your circumstances and apart from your limited understanding, the cross remains. The cross of Christ remains. And that's why in verse 32, he said, He who did not spare his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? What does that mean? The cross remains. He is good. Even if I don't understand how these circumstances can happen in my life and he still be good. He is still good. He laid down his life for me. He didn't spare his own son for me. He delivered him up for me. Your word says, Lord, that if we seek you, we're going to lack no good thing. Your word says, Lord, that you are our shepherd and we shall not be in want. You've already given me your son, God. You've already delivered him up for me, God. And that doesn't change. The cross remains, and that helps me to understand in this moment and in these circumstances that you are still for me, even if I don't understand it. You are still with us. You will still freely give us anything that would be of eternal benefit to us. And if you don't do it the way that I think you should, it means you have a better plan and a better purpose. And what you're allowing in our lives is working that plan and purpose out. So here we've just read two verses in this section. And so far we know God is for us. No one can be against us. God gave us his one and only son. God delivered him up for us to save us from our sin. And then how then shall he not with him freely give us anything that would actually be eternally beneficial for us? A few more questions, a few more answers. Verses 33 and 34. Verse 33. Who shall bring a charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. Who is he who condemns? It is Christ who died and furthermore is also risen, who is even at the right hand of God, who also makes intercession for us. In the book of Hebrews, it says that Jesus is able to save us to the uttermost and that he ever lives to intercede for us by the power of an endless and indestructible life. And any time anyone brings any charge against us, Jesus is there to intercede for us, to argue for us, to be our eternal advocate. We get a picture of this in Zechariah chapter 3. Do you remember that? Remember when there was a vision, Joshua is standing there, it's a courtroom scene, there's a judge, there's a prosecutor, there's an advocate, and there's Joshua, and Joshua represents us. And the accuser is the devil himself, bringing accusations. Here's what happens when the devil brings accusations against us. He doesn't have to lie. And they look at his clothes, and his clothes represents his righteousness, and they're filthy rags. And as the devil brings accusations, the advocate says, the Lord rebuke you, Satan. Isn't this one that was snatched from the fire, still smells like smoke? (laughs) But he's mine. And if he's mine, then I can take those filthy rags off of him and put on him robes of righteousness. And I love that scene there because Zechariah is watching this vision, and it says very clearly that while Zechariah was watching this vision and God said, take his filthy rags off and put on robes of righteousness, Zechariah says, and put a clean turban on his head. (laughs) He just gets so excited to see this metaphor for what would happen to him if he stood before a holy God. You'd have an accuser of the brethren. That's what Satan's name means. And we have an advocate who doesn't point, who has a wounded hand. And he looks at the judge who is his father and says, he's mine. Remember my blood? He's mine. And then the father says, forgiven, free. Take the filthy rags off. Put on robes of righteousness. And anyone standing around who understands all this is say, put a clean turban on his head too. This is awesome. Who is going to bring a charge against God's elect? The Lord rebuke you, Satan. It's God who justifies. Who is he that condemns? Christ is our advocate. 
He's standing right next to us, ever living to intercede for us by the power of an endless and indestructible life. No one's going to outwit him. No one's going to beat him. We're able to be saved to the uttermost because of him, period. No asterisk. Fully and completely. Verse 35, who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? As it is written, for your sake we are killed all day long. We are accounted as sheep for the slaughter. I like the Phillips translation on this one. It says, indeed, some of us know the truth of this ancient text. For your sake, we are killed all day long. We are accounted as sheep for the slaughter. Yes, the meantime includes pain. And for some of us, it's physical persecution and difficulty. All over the world, Christians are being killed today. For some of us, it means spilling coffee on your shirt just before you go up to preach. And that's the extent of your difficulty and pain. And you're furiously trying to dry it in the bathroom before you go up there, hoping no one will know about it. But now you're using it as an illustration in the message. So now everyone knows about it. And that's the extent of your difficulty and pain. But Jesus will get us through this. <laughs> Amen. I, you know, I, it's okay for us to laugh as we process this because it's, it, it's, it takes some just thought of like being in the midst of this. Like, how are we more than conquerors through him who loved us if he allows us to go through such brutal difficulty? You guys saw me last week being intentionally vulnerable and frail because I was convicted that you only see me when I'm fully rested, fully prepared, groomed, speaking eloquently, all that. I'm human just like you. I bleed just like you. I screw up just like you. I doubt God's provision just like you. I get scared about the future just like you. I'm struggling to hold on to these things with, you know, every fiber of my being just like you. I ask the same questions. How can I be more than a conqueror? How can I be more than a conqueror when you allow brutal difficulty in our life? Things that are way beyond our ability, way beyond our heart's capacity to endure. And the only thing that keeps coming back to mind, and I don't fully understand it, I don't expect you to either, is when Jesus was in the bottom of the boat sleeping, in the middle of a satanic storm. What does it mean to be more than a conqueror, more than victorious? There was a storm raging all around him. His circumstances were perilous, not only for himself personally, but also for the people that he cared for. And for some reason, he found peace that passed understanding this to the point where he was able to sleep in the bottom of the boat. Do you know in the 10 times that I went down to Rochester, about halfway through, I developed this thing where I couldn't sleep whenever I went down there? Couldn't sleep. Couldn't sleep because I was worried about someone, you know, kicking in the door back at home and I was an hour and a half away from my family. Worried about this, worried about that, worried about this, worried about that. I want to find out what this means. I want to know what it means to be more than a conqueror. I want to be able to so trust the favor of my father that I could find peace that surpasses me figuring it out. That I could find the courage to stand and to testify Think of the peace of the countless martyrs praying for their persecutors in the fire from the midst of the flames, confident of better things to come. Think of the courage of the countless Shadrachs, Meshachs, and Abednegoes who throughout history have said to the countless Nebuchadnezzars, our God will save us from your fire, and even if he doesn't, we still want you to know that we will not bow to you, for we only bow to him. 
That seems to me to be more than a conqueror, different than a conqueror, more than a conqueror. Such peace that passes understanding, such courage that did not originate in us, all available to us in Christ, all given to us by Christ. This is what we're learning. This is what we're understanding. This is what Paul had become fully convinced of. Listen to these last two verses three times, and then we'll close. For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Again, and I am convinced that nothing can ever separate us from God's love, neither death, nor life, neither angels, nor demons, neither our fears for today, nor our worries about tomorrow. Not even the powers of hell can separate us from God's love. No power in the sky above or in the earth below. Indeed, nothing in all of creation will ever be able to separate us from the love of God that is revealed in Christ Jesus our Lord. Again, I have become absolutely convinced that neither death nor life, neither the messenger of heaven nor the monarch of the earth, neither what happens today nor what might happen tomorrow, neither a power from on high nor a power from below, nor anything else in God's whole world has any power to separate us from the love of God in Jesus Christ our Lord. What are we gonna say to these things? <laughs> I think amen's a great word. <laughs> And I hope the principalities and powers heard. These are the things we are becoming convinced of. This is where we take our stand. And may we be found with the same conviction as we're sustained by God's great love, great grace, and we trust the favor of our Father, even when we don't understand. Lord, here we are, halfway through this great book you've given to us, and we've wrestled with you. We've told you that we're not letting you go until we understand this, until you bless us, until you give us the peace that surpasses understanding it, until you give us the courage to live this out, the gift of faith to live this out. And we know, Lord, that these are gifts, and we're so thankful for that these good things that you want to give us, peace and courage and faith. You've given us your son. You're a good shepherd. You're a good father. You know how to give good gifts. You've given us your Holy Spirit. How much more so will you give us peace and courage and faith? We refuse, Lord, to muster these things up. We repent from constantly trying to muster these things up because we think that's what a good Christian does. We acknowledge how empty our hands are, and we just look to you in heaven, and we say, you've given us Jesus. You've given us the Holy Spirit. I mean, what's peace and courage and faith? We really need those things too, Lord, so we trust that you've given those things to us. Now help us, Lord, by the power of your spirit to live your more than victorious life out in the world, but not of the world, until kingdom come. We're so thankful for you, Lord. Thanks for never giving up on us, continually calling us back to yourself and renewing our faith and trust in you. We overflow, Lord. We're overwhelmed in the best way. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.